Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Good afternoon, <laughs> uh, or good morning, or whenever you're listening to this Painting of the Week. And we have a super painting, Laura and I, to talk about today. I think one of our favourites, it's fair to say. Mm-hmm which is called Luncheon of the Boating Party, or at least that's what it's known by. Uh, In English, it is at the Phillips in Washington, which is a wonderful gallery, and I 100% recommend it to anybody who's ever in Washington. uh, The painting was bought by a guy called Duncan Phillips, and um, it is now, the gallery's in his name, and it's been proudly displayed ever since the moment he bought it. Anyway, and it's by Renoir. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, We made a film about Renoir called Renoir Revered and Reviled, um, which we can talk about, but he's an interesting artist, an impressionist artist, of course, um, but an artist who at one point in his lifetime decided that he'd had enough really with impressionism and changed direction and went off in a direction that not everybody liked very much. Anyway, we'll come on to that. But, fabulous painting um, from 1880, 1881. So, what, 140 something years ago. Um, Laura, let's have a look at this painting. I know. Well, okay, can I ask you a question straight away? Yeah. So, would it have been recently that you would have been standing in front of? Uh, didn't you go to Washington not long ago? Well, it's funny, it feels not long ago. Actually, it's probably 2019. Oh, that's so quite that's, a while ago then. That's the impact of COVID, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Yeah. I mean, some things that have come around in 2022, and you think, oh, yeah, that hasn't happened since 2019. Yeah. Um, but no, 2019, um, I... I went to interview the director. Oh, no, actually, I just went to visit, but I had interviewed the director about this painting and about Renoir for that Renoir film. Well, that and, was, did, and you featured the painting in your bit, film? It's in the film. Mm. It's such a key painting. Um, well, it's wonderful. But, um, yeah, if I can, if I'm in Washington, I will go to the gallery. Um, well, I, 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 I'd like to know... Who wouldn't love this painting? I mean, huh. there's going to be people, of course, but I can't really see a reason why you wouldn't love it. Well... Is that a really naive thing to say? I think there are some people who who aren't that fond of Impressionist paintings. Yeah. Who might look at this and find it a little bit... I don't know, what would they find it? Well, I don't know. What, a bit what superficial, was, maybe? Maybe. I mean, it's just... It's, I mean, it doesn't sure. make you feel... Well, it doesn't make me feel n- not in a good mood. I mean, it's wonder- I just think it's lovely. Oh, I mean, who... I mean, you know, it certainly makes me want to be there. Yes. That's, it makes me want to go... That space at the end of the table. <laughs> it, well, that is us, isn't that where we're going to be sitting? Um, we, go, I mean, we want to go boating. I might keep my shirt on, if I'm honest. <laughs> but, but, um... <laughs> yeah, I mean... If you want to go boating with your top hat on. Oh, I've never worn one of those types of hats, but I'd love to. Any of those hats would be fantastic. <laughs> Maybe one time with the podcast we should recreate a scene. <laughs> I mean, yes, we should. <laughs> that would be really good. I mean, one of the great things about the Impressionist painters, and we've said this before, is that you get an immediate, I think, most people get an immediate visceral pleasure by looking at a painting like this. Mm. It is full of life and energy. Uh, there's so much to look at whether it's just the still lives of the fruit, which look like they, you could just pick them up and eat them. You, know, you can almost hear the chinking of the glass. You can almost, you know, you can hear the sounds of the river behind, the conversation, um, little dog that's oh, being Oh, I know, it's just so cuddled. lovely. So there's all that in it. Mm. Look a bit more closely, and we, we'll, we'll come on to this, and you actually start to see Renoir's skill in both rendering lifelike portraits because these are real people and we Mm. can talk about who they are in a second Um, but also just the way he constructs the painting 
you know, he's a, he is a master painter and it's very cleverly constructed and organized, which is also very interesting. Um, and you can even go a little bit further and, and start to look at, you know, how society is reflected by these paintings and the role of women. I mean, the film that we were talking about not so long ago about Hopper um, and the discussion in that film about women going out to, you know, to eat, the way they dressed. The, I mean, this reflects French mid-19th century society where women here are being portrayed as equals to men. Yeah. Um, but it's such a... Most of, well, most of his paintings like that, are they... But they're all... they just... I don't know. They all seem just full of joy. I don't, I don't... I looked at most of them and I was just like, I can't see many that I don't really like. And there's a lot of movement. They all have a lot of energy. So with this painting, and like you said, in later, I know you're going to... You're going to go triangles on him, <laughs> eyes drawn here and all that. Mm. But would that scene actually... Or did he actually... He went... Or he did... He must have done a bit of a sketch of all of them. Then apparently he took it away, did finish it off. So do you think they were at some stage placed in and around the table like that? No. No. Okay. So it's a real place. Mm. It is a... Have, rest- you been, have you been there? No. Oh, Phil, come on. There's another place to go. Okay, that's, that's a <laughs> podcast trip to do. <laughs> Apparently it still exists. It's a restaurant now. I, I did look it up before today's podcast. Um, it was closed and then it was reopened. Um, whether it's still open post-COVID, I don't know. No. But it's on the Seine, and it was somewhere that Renoir went, and a couple of his, fr- you know, his friends would go. Kai Botts, another great Impressionist painter, um, he would go there. And you, know, you can see photographs which show this balcony um, where they are, 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 are placed. Right. So it was a real place. And Renoir would have gone with some of these individuals. Um, I suspect, personally, that he would have made a sketch of the balcony and of the table. Um, And maybe, I I think there is some evidence that some of the people were placed in. Yeah. Um, If you look at the, the woman on the left with the dog, so she's tremendously interesting because... That is a woman called Aline Charigot. And uh, with her dog, which I know is an Affen Pincher dog. <laughs> um, and actually, we know that somebody was modelling for him at this table because it was another woman at first who he apparently got irritated with for whatever reason, probably because she wasn't sitting still. And he got rid of her and brought in Aline, who was a seamstress. And um, it's interesting because three or four years later, she would um, give birth to their first son, I think, and they eventually had three, yeah. and they would eventually marry. So this mm. is... A, it's it, handy for her, though, wasn't it? it was a handy, that was a handy move well, for her to well, be put in there. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I, think he, I think he knew her, but I mean, she would later become a model in many of his paintings. Um, and, and so... Hearing the story about the other model being dismissed, obviously that gives you a sense that some people were obviously placed in position. Mm. But I can't believe that however many people are there, was it 13, were just, you know, because if he's painting them, they have to stand still. So I think some... So for me, if I was looking at this, I would guess that maybe the three people nearest to us, they may have been in position... Maybe the lady leading on the um, oh yeah on the rail on the rail maybe, but the others I think he's he's constructed that or he's done sketches of individuals in different positions, and I think he just wants to get his friends in, which is not uncommon. There's other paintings by other impressionist artists where they they throw in their friends into the into the general melee just for fun. Um, so it's interesting to know that he probably wasn't having a lunch with all his friends in one go. No. Oh, OK. But I think it shows his skill as a portraitist that people immediately know. And, for example, his wife, 
if you tra trace her through his subsequent paintings, I mean, you know, her, her features remain consistent. Um, you know, I spent a while on looking at all these people and then I got a bit caught up. <laughs> well, because the art sort of world loves all their facts and everything mm, else. Mm. But then there's this one face for me in the middle. Uh, behind, so there's the lady who's on the right looking at the, uh, the man with the straw hat. Yeah. And then behind her is another lady who is another actress, I believe. Drinking. Drinking. Yeah. And uh, supposedly she's ignoring her partner, who is this or man. Or just the face. Yes. And then I'm looking all through and I'm thinking, well, no one's mentioned. Who is this man? And then I started to think, oh. Oh, you're funny, because I, I counted up 13 people. Yeah, it's actually 14. 14. It's 14, Yeah, look, yeah. I've written 14, yeah. couldn't find the answer. Mm. And I thought, well, isn't that funny? Why isn't there some article? And then you know how sometimes we, what, we look at a painting, you say, oh, the artist has just put themselves in. So I looked and looked, and I couldn't find it. But it did make me laugh, because I managed to think all these other names for all these other people, and... Um, and I did think, oh, I did wonder who that was. Because like you said, there's never any mistakes. Hmm. Well, well I, don't, I don't think that's Renoir in there. I don't know who no. that is. <laughs> unless I mean, he thought he was, unless he was very, well, I don't know. It was, cause wasn't this one of his later paintings? I mean, what I like about this is the guy mm. who's leaning on the left, left yeah. of frame, he's the son of the owner of the, of the maison, mm. uh, Fournaise. I think it's called isn't that right yeah um so he was he would have been out pulling in the boats and but here he is he's part of the lunch you know it's all all social classes mixing you know, it's not like you know you you have to you yeah know, you're a worker you can't so it's quite um it looks quite pleased with how it's all quite, going quite democratic in that respect and then you've got the actresses um who else do we know there there's a there's an art critic isn't there uh haven't we got his... It's the former mayor, is the guy that's... I don't know how oh, they yeah, know... not looking. But the guy who's got his back to us, who's obviously having a chat, very intimate chat Ooh, with the bar, daughter yeah. of the restaurant owners, mm -hmm. um, Alphonsine, and she had been painted by Renoir a couple of years earlier. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, there's, there's... Well, the... The one in the very, very foreground, the num well, we've got we've got them numbered. <laughs> Whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know. I thought it was quite a good idea to number them. Which one have you got? <laughs> numbered. Well, no, we're not so much numbered. I've got mine. I've got all mine labelled. <laughs> oh, very good. So who are you pointing out? Uh, Gustav. How are we saying? Kaibo. This? Yeah. Oh, so. He but he's a painter in himself. Oh, he's fantastic. And I, I looked at his work, and I did. I thought, oh, he's lovely work. His picture of the wood mm. planers, I've had that print up on my wall for oh, a have you? Yeah, yeah. He was, he was very interesting because he was independently wealthy, so he could paint whatever he liked. Um, didn't really have to follow the market. Renoir wasn't so badly off either, actually. Um, very, Renoir was very prolific. I mean, this painting... Um, so Renoir, Renoir exhibits with the Impressionists right from the start so the first impressionist show is what 1876 so this i think went into the third impressionist show and actually for the impressionist was quite well received um which certainly wasn't always the case um but actually after the after that show he then tried going back to the salon trying to get a bit more kind of more conservative Oh, okay. standard respect of the art world. Um, he started to get a little bit tired of, of, of Impressionism. So, you know, the sense of trying to capture a moment, capture light. Um, you know, if you look, let's have a look at the, at the painting. And obviously, what we, as ever, want to encourage people to look quite carefully. So, now some people might do a whole painting just as, as a still life. I mean, here there's so many different elements yeah. to this. If you look at the fruit alone, it is a big painting, by the way. I mean, it's, it's um, if you go to the website and look back at an old, when I used to do um, some written analysis of paintings, I think there might be a picture of me standing next to the painting. 
and it is, okay, it's a big painting. Be, yeah. But still, that's still life with the grapes and the everything else that's on it. And the glasses. Absolutely I love the beautiful. glasses. The glasses are fantastic. They're, they're, they're really, Bo- really, bowls of mm, wine. Mm-hmm. Um, Aline on the left, I mean, the dog and her, fantastic. I mean, that alone is worthy of a single... I mean, there's, there's almost numerous paintings within the painting here. Yeah. Um, gets a bit sketchier as you go towards the back. You almost feel that the characters at the back are kind of squeezed in. He just wants to get his mates in there. Um, <laughs> it does, though, doesn't it? When you actually look at it. It's like a selfie, you know. When, whenever I do you know, my running races, after the race, everyone from the club's like, come on, quick, quick, everyone get in, get in, squeeze in, squeeze in. Um, it doesn't make for very beautiful pictures, but it's a, it's a record of, of your friends in a particular moment. I think that it, there is a sense of that here. He's just he's trying to... There's no real direct sunlight, is there, or anything on, on this one either, because of the awning um, above. Yeah, so... the light's probably... Um, I hadn't actually looked at that, but if we tried to... Just, I mean, I'm not sure you could even work out where the, where the what, light's what coming the light from. Source is. No. There's a little bit on the side of her mm. head, so some coming in from the yeah. side. It's bouncing around, isn't it? Oh, it's such a lovely picture. I mean, I really, really love his. I like. I really like his work. I mean, with that awning, in fact, the whole thing would be probably should even be slightly pinker light, really. <laughs> now um, we really question his work. But it's very interesting how he kind of envelops it with the with the reeds and the and the bushes behind, so that you're not distracted by the river. The river's there. You can see it through the foliage. You know, a few little boats, house top left. But that's not the subject, that's just in the background. So there's not many paintings that have got a combination of group portraiture, landscape, still life. Is that right? I don't, well... Because he's got all three there. Fair point. He's got everything, hasn't he? Yeah, well, there's the landscape in the distance with the little boats. I mean, certainly, it's a tour de force, I mean... Even even if you look at the perspective of the individuals, it's very realistic. I mean, you do feel like you've just walked into a genuine lunch. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, and again, if you start deconstructing it a bit with the, with the lines, so, you know, the way in which that awning, those lines, the diagonals taking you across the picture and then down the picture, you know, you've got the end of the tables. I mean, the whole thing's connected up to... So, if we start bottom left, come down her elbow, you go along the top of the table and you've got that kind of napkin, which delib- kind of deliberately pulls you to his hand. Yeah. Then your eye goes down his arm, it goes up his elbow. I think that's part of the reason that they've got their shirts off, frankly, because it's a way of driving you around the picture. You go up, not, I don't think there's any accident. There's a kind of white bit of paint at the top of his shoulder because your eye's always going to the white. Then, again, the face is brighter than the back of his head, so you go into the face. That then takes you, in my opinion, takes you to her face. But she's tilted, so you, that, your, your gaze is then thrown up to yeah. the guy above. Again, he's got a white collar on, so that draws your eye up. You hit him. His face is kind of evenly lit, more or less, allowing you to go past him to the three people behind. Again, you see that bit of white there, a few little bits of white, just drawing your eye back. And you've got the three faces. You kind of have a little look around there. And then you're going to go off to the guy on the left with the top hat on. Again, white collar bringing you over. Curved shoulder. It's all, it's all very cleverly worked out. The curved shoulder takes you down to her. Uh, you look around her face. You look around the glass. You've got the hand. I think the hand... See, I think the guy to her right is rather missed because he doesn't... Your eye isn't really directed to him. No. Because I think from her hand holding the glass, that then shoots you up to the guy above. Again, the thing that's brightest about him is his hand, which, when you get to his hand, then throws you left. You bounce over the chap's hat, uh, and you might just go down to his face, but then the shoulder and the lights on the shoulder takes you from bottom right to left up to her face. Very carefully... Cleverly, you look at her face, you can bounce down the arm, which is like holding up her chin, but it's taking your eye down. You hit the other arm, which is deliberately then on the banister, the balustrade, 
which takes you back along the balustrade to the chap's vest. You go around the vest, around his face, down that arm on the left, <laughs> which brings you right around to her shoulder, which bangs you back into her face. And that's your circle. It's funny, isn't it? All absolutely brilliantly worked mm. out. And if you wanted to, you could probably even go the other way around, although we read left to right, so you probably wouldn't. It is so clever. So clever. And then when you, when you look the second time, you probably... You probably do an internal swirl and then you start looking at the way he's organised the food and bottles and things. Really clever, really clever. So you're saying that he tried to pull away from the others a little bit. He tried to... As an artist? Yeah. Well, I mean, some artists, and again, we recently talked about this with Hopper, they kind of reach... They develop a certain style and then they stick with it. Mm. And they just kind of refine it and refine it and refine it. So Hopper's oil paintings, really, the last 20, I don't know, 20, 30 years of his life, pretty much the same, looking at an individual or a couple through a window or on a bed. or um, Whereas some artists, Picasso is a good example, Rembrandt, Matisse, they're constantly re- reimagining, redeveloping, um, trying new things, trying new directions. Well, Renoir kind of got... He felt that Impressionism after a while was a bit limiting. Right. Um, and he experimented a bit with pointillism where oh, yeah. Surat and like all these tiny little dots, but that's so time consuming, he got a bit fed up with that. Then he started doing these kind of late fleshy nudes mm-hmm. and he did a lot of them. And they, it's a bit reductive to say he just became, you know, it was a middle age crisis and he just, <laughs> he just had all these desires for these models. That's not entirely true. Um, but, you know, we made a film about him and looked at this period because we made the film based on the collection at the Barnes, which is an amazing collection in Philadelphia, which doesn't travel, part of the bequest of... Alfred Barnes was that the paintings would never leave the walls. Oh, anyway, if I remember correctly, and it is from memory, I think he has three hundred and thirty. To anyway, he's got Amazing. he's got a huge amount of Renoirs, and many of them are these late nudes. Mm. And when you first look at them, they're not really to my taste personally. When you start but again, when you start looking a bit more closely and reading about Renoir. And, reading about how towards the end of his life he also started getting into sculpture, although because he had arthritis he had to use somebody else to actually oh, mould yeah. it. What he's actually doing is he's, he's moving towards three-dimensionality. These fleshy nudes are actually... You, he's almost seeing around them and they, they really fill the frame. Um, and it's, I, I would argue it's a step towards cubism, so, way, for example, if you've ever seen one of Picasso's guitars, when at first you look at it and it all looks all jumbled up, mm. what he's basically trying to say is he's showing you all sides of the guitar at one time. Um, so, that essentially, that's what cubism is. Um, and Renoir kind of moves that way. Uh, he's trying to give you a complete sense of this woman's body and his, and his examination of light. And there's a little bit of the old man's gaze, there's no question. Mm. Some people really don't like them. No. Um, and the film has people in, in it who also make a case for them. Um, but it's a definite departure from Impressionism. So, impressionism, is it literally just brush strokes and colour? Well, I mean, it was, you know, painting in the open air, on plan air. Oh, yeah. it, there was one element of it which was, you know, never use black. Okay. Which obviously people like Manny ignored. Um, there was a sense of trying to catch the ephemeral nature of light, that moment. Um, it was also the subject matter. They weren't necessarily the first, and often people forget how influential other periods, other artists are. But it certainly was, there was much more attention to ordinary people changing, okay. cha- you know, steam trains and boats and and... Entertainment, yeah, um, and that light, that light. It's funny though because they were a group, and I was thinking the other day, but all very different individuals. Yeah, individuals, but as painters, if you had a Christmas quiz, mm. <laughs> and you picked a rare one of each one mm, of them, mm. one which was unknown, and put it out, yeah, 
would, would you think, do you think you'd be able to pick yeah. the difference between a Passario, a Renoir, Passaro, Renoir, yeah. sorry, Renoir, Sicily, yeah. Cassatt? I would now. You, you, okay. But I mean, I, I mean I'm not, not to say I wouldn't make a mistake, but... I would definitely make a mistake. But I mean, I think... I think you can tell a difference. You can tell the difference between a Monet and a Manet, okay. despite the fact their names are so similar. <laughs> um, I mean that immediately. St- that's interesting. So that immediately strikes me as a Renoir. Mm. Um, so the question is, what is it about that painting that tells you that it's not Monet, mm. Degas, Cassatt, Morisot? Um, because other painters wouldn't have that question necessarily, would they? Whereas with the Impressionists, then you just think, oh, I wonder if you could tell the difference, Phil. Mm. But I, I think I would, I wouldn't be able to on um, some of them. I would. I Renoir I would. My mum and dad absolutely love Renoir, mm-hmm. but it was on the walls, so that's an easy one for me. But as it when it came to the style and the painting style, when we looked at Cassatt, Sicily, maybe. Mm. I don't know. If I was in some rare ones, really rare, would I be able to tell a difference? Well, I think sometimes the subject matter... I mean, I think... I mean, Monet, for example, was absolutely, totally, totally fixated with the nature of light. Right. I don't think Renoir's quite as concerned about that. No. He's got an awning up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you think of Monet going out for weeks at a time painting the front of... Rouen Cathedral or haystacks, grain stacks or... Mm. Um, Manet was very influenced by the Spanish, so, you know, some quite dark, black, singular portraits, you know, even black portraits against black. Right. Renoir does tend to go for the sense of environment, the sense of place, people dancing in a ballroom. Yeah. They all seem to have a bit of locations. fun, don't they? Sense of, well, they, a lot of them seem to have it looked like he was having a good time as well yeah though it was hard for all these impressionists really mm. I mean they weren't um, I mean part of the appeal of his works is that you think that looks like fun mm. you know <laughs> I mean he did I mean I think his portraitures I mean he, he he was he was making money from selling portraits and doing portraits of families and individuals I think you can see that here, his ability to capture somebody's likeness. Yeah. Um, no, it's and interesting. I, and I think, he, I think that's... I mean, part, you know, part of the reason he moved to the south of France was because of his rheumatism and he just needed warmer weather. Uh, I think, you know, it's easier then when you're suffering in that way to just go to the studio at the bottom of the garden and paint a model. Yeah. Than, you know. Yeah. Well, I love it. It's a really, really interesting... I mean, there's so much to talk about, to say about it. Yeah. Um, all of it. I love the dresses and all the paintings. I love his... Oh, I just love them. I like the hats. <laughs> I definitely would like to be there. I'd love a glass of wine with them all. I just think they just look lovely. They, yeah. they are. They all look like kind of interesting people, don't they? They do. They look like it took a long time to get ready in the morning. <laughs> Maybe not, the, maybe not the proprietor's son. <laughs> He's got a bit more work to do. But yeah, I just, I just think they're lovely. I love them. I don't, I just don't see anything about them that I wouldn't really. I could say, oh, I'm not sure about that one. Mm. I think, oh no, I'll pop that on my wall for sure. So, yeah, I'm a hundred percent. Well, there's a table. There's a, there's a, there's a space at the end of the table. Yeah. Just waiting for you. In fact, there's a, is that a spare glass? In fact, of course there is. Maybe. Either, either that's your or Renoir's own glass. But there's three glasses there, so either oh, uh, yeah. Aline's having a variety of drinks. <laughs> that's why he married her. She was really fun. Or maybe Renoir's just got up to sketch this. and <laughs> ah, It's a great picture. And if anyone's ever in Washington... Um, obviously, I should have said right at the beginning, the picture is, of course, hopefully by now you're <laughs> looking at it. That. But it's 7-art.com. <laughs> And there is a YouTube version of this podcast where you can look at the picture while hearing us talk about it. Um, I would absolutely recommend watching the film Renoir Revered and Reviled. Um, 
This painting was first owned by Paul Durand Ruel, who was the absolutely key dealer without whom we wouldn't have Impressionism in the way that we do now. Um, he saved a lot of them from starvation or having to take another route. And we have another film, um, which is all about Paul Durand Ruel and the history of the Impressionists, also an exhibition on screen film. Plenty of films, actually. Oh, I think I want to watch that one, the film. Oh, you should definitely. Oh, you, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And plen- The Man Who Made the Impressionists. Um, or oh, The Impressionists are The Man Who Made Them, to give it its proper title. And, of course, there are box sets. And also, we've got so many films about The Impressionists. But they're worth it. I mean, they are the most popular. I think they're the most popular genre. Mm. But, actually, I think that's... I know some people think, oh, you know, come on, we're in the 21st century now, we need to be talking about contemporary artists, or actually, you you ignore or you overlook the Impressionists at your peril. They are, it's such an interesting period of history, and they are such great artists. Mm. Um, and this is a fantastic example of that. So, um, if you're in Washington, go to the Phillips, check it out. Nice. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.